evening, fellow Democrats. I'm LACDP Chairman Mark Gonzalez, and I'm here to welcome you to our first Candidate on Candidate series. As we head into the November election, we want to highlight some of our LACDP endorsed candidates and give them an opportunity to talk about their lives, their views, and what's next for them as we look towards November. We hope you enjoy this series over the next couple of months. So without further ado, please welcome candidate for Los Angeles District Attorney, George Gascon, and candidate for Los Angeles County Unified School Board District 7, Patricia Castellanos. How are you? How's it hey, going? Hey, George. It's great to see you. Good to see you as well. You know, it's exciting to be at this moment. And, uh, you know, we're both running for office under a very, very different, um, a very different world. And I just wanted to know how's everything with you? How's, uh, how's your family holding together, your work? Um, well, it's, uh, it's extraordinary times for sure. Uh, you know, I count my blessings every day. I'm healthy, my daughter's healthy, my family's healthy. And so I, I, I feel very fortunate in the grand scheme of things to be able to say that I'm healthy. Um, you know, it's challenging being at home all day, <laughs> every day. Uh, as someone compared um, the movie where every day is the same day, but um, I do feel fortunate. It's, you know, it's a juggling act being at home, working full time, and also trying to support my daughter um, through her, you know, distance learning yep. um, and having to play many roles uh, that I had, hadn't played before with her. So, you know, her, her classmate, her teacher, her mom, um, but we're, we're handling it as well as we can. I think we're, you know, we're, we're getting to spend a lot more time together. Um, so it's all, you know, I, yeah, I feel very Wonderful. lucky. How about awesome. you? How are you uh, managing? We're working. I have an incredible team. So we're, we're working through it and, you know, becoming very digitally savvy, very, very quickly. Um, but, you know, Patricia, I, I, you know, I really have, uh, something that, you know, I wanted to ask you because I, I've sort of followed your career and, you know, you, I, I think you have an incredible path and, you know, the work that you do. What, what's, what drives you? What was brought you to public service? Why do you want to run for LAUSD board? Uh, just, just really curious. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, it's in, you know, I will try to keep it brief. I think this is the question that, uh, that probably, gets elicits the longest answer for me. So I'll try to, to keep it short for you. I am um, maybe just starting with the second part of the, the question, which is why I'm running for school board. I, I came across a post yesterday. I think it might've been something that UTLA reposted that said some of the lines of um, the public school is the best defense of a democratic nation. And that rings so, and has always rung really true for me. And you know, I think it's even more urgent now. It is, you know, when we think about the the state that our country is in, um, even pre-COVID, but, you know, certainly now we need to find and, and strengthen the institutions that up, uphold our democracy. And I see public education as critical um, to that. And yet, for decades now, at least 40 decades, half a century, we've been peeling away resources from the most vital resource that we have as, as a nation. And who suffers most are our students and our children, and you know, more to the point, especially here in LA, who suffers most, uh, who, who that's the biggest detriment to is uh, um, students from poor and working class families and our communities of color. And, you know, I, I, you know, I've thought for many years and decades that we need real champions uh, to, to lead and fight for resources for our public schools, fight our institution of public education for our students, and to provide a quality, quality education for all of our families, regardless of the circumstance. And that, you know, the, the notion you know, creating a just community, a just environment um, for working class communities, families, um, you know, poor families and families of black and brown families across LA predates my candidates, you know, my candidacy. I've, you know, started as an organizer, uh, as a young organizer, many, many, dec you know, 25 years ago um, for a positive change and working alongside these communities to improve 
conditions on the job for workers, but also fighting to improve conditions in their community and fight for more opportunities. And I want to continue my role as an advocate, as a fighter, um, you know, bring that fight from the outside and into, into the board, the school wonderful, board. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. How about you? So tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, your path and, you know, so what's uh, what what prompted you to run for DA? Yeah, you know, from a high school dropout from Catahay. Uh, <laughs> Welcome back, by the way. Yeah, thank you so much. So, you know, I think that uh, a lot of people don't know this, but, you know, my family immigrated here from uh, uh, Cuba in the late 1960s. And actually, my unfortunately, my school experience uh, as I transitioned as a young immigrant here wasn't a good one. I dropped out of school. Uh, but, you know, I grew up in the community. I spent a lot of years in the LAPD and tell people that I was both part of the system then I became someone that wanted to reform the system and now someone that actually believes that the system needs to be completely right. uh, re-engineered because the system actually is doing what it was intended to do, which, you know, we can get into that at another moment. Uh, but, you know, someone running for district attorney in LA and then coming back home, after having been a DA in San Francisco for nearly nine years and, you know, engaging in a lot of, a lot of efforts to reduce mass incarceration and to create a different reality for poor people, not only in San Francisco, but statewide in the country. And then coming back home and seeing the, the despair that I've seen in the, the faces of so many people, people that, you know, quite frankly, come from communities like the one I grew up in. You know, I grew up in a one bedroom apartment. I slept in the, in the living room on a couch. Uh, and, and seeing the, the, the high levels of incarceration that, that continue without any connection to public safety um, in this county, you know, four times the level of incarceration of uh, San Francisco County. Yeah, we had a, a net reduction per capita in violent crime. Here in LA, there's been a 30% capita increase. Uh, looking at children being prosecuted as adults and continuing that practice that is so, uh, so out of step with science. Um, you know, criminalize um, and uh, the death penalty, and we treat our uh, our mentally ill uh, members of our community, and the way that we treat the poor, uh, and it's just it's really uh, heartbreaking for me. The lack of police accountability, and, and the pretty much you know, uh, we have a DA that continues to take money in such a large quantity from police unions. Uh, and continues to look the other way at, at police violence at levels that frankly, I mean, we talk about George Floyd and obviously that was a horrendous in, incident and, you know, there's no no way to to really completely express just how outraged that was. But, you know, we've had about 600 killings here in police and, and basically, you know, we have a DA that, that uh, refuses to do her job. So, it's the things that really motivate me uh, to, uh, you know, as we were coming back home, to, to just really engage in, in work to try to create a different reality for my hometown, but also understanding that because LA County is so large, in fact, we are the largest in the country and the impact that we have statewide and nationally, being a leader in reimagining uh, the system and, you know, reducing incarceration and putting more money into schools. I mean, it, it's so much resonated with me when you talk about the, the lack of funding for schools. And, you know, guess what? We know where the funding is gone. It's gone to the criminal justice system, right? It's gone to police and prosecutors and prisons and jails. And how do we start defunding that and putting that money back where it should go, which is in schools? Because I, I do agree with the message that UTLA uh, said that, you know, the path to democracy is, is a public education. And so how do we start moving away from, you know, criminal justice and getting into education and public health? So that's really what drives that's me. That's fantastic. You, um, you mentioned, I think throughout that, I appreciate that, um, a little bit of just your growing up in LA. And I'm curious how, how you see your, your school experience having shaped you um, and, and who, who you are yeah. Uh, today. Yeah, you know, I tell you, it's an interesting thing, right? Because I, I was one of the few, uh, well, if you're an immigrant, maybe not, they still become a little older, but I had to compare and contrast, right? I went to school all the way through the eighth grade mm -hmm. in Cuba. And, you know, frankly, 
we were poor, very embracing system, and it was a system where you don't see the inequalities that you see here. Um, and, and I thrive in that system, and you know, I knew that I was a good student, right? And then all of a sudden coming into the system, obviously uh, not being able to speak the language and, and doing very poorly and being told that I was stupid, and, and, and that really, that sort of was my path to eventually, oh, okay, and, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to justify, by the way, I could have done it differently, but I didn't. I sort of disengaged from school and left. But what's really interesting for me as I uh, became a professional and get to know more people is that in talking to many uh, African-American and Latino, uh, you know, members of our community, that my age or a little younger and, and often, I would often bring my experience and they look at me and say, well, I had the same thing happen to me. Uh, I understand that, you know, when I was told I was stupid, I knew better because I came from a system where I was a, you know, I was a good B plus student. I mean, I was not the brightest, but certainly I wasn't stupid. Uh, but then understood, you know, for a young kid that has never had that experience and all of a sudden he or she's being told that they're stupid, from a very early age, they begin to believe it, right? And, and how we keep our people down that way. And sometimes, you know, by the way, being told you're stupid, it doesn't have to be quote unquote, somebody telling you you're stupid. It's by implication, right? You're treated, the things that you're given, the way that, that your educational journey is, is handled by the system and by the people that are supposed to be entrusted with your well being. And it just dawned on me the damage that yeah. is often into so many uh, poor people, and and that really has informed my my seal for, you know, frankly, uh, you know, really looking at the criminal justice system, especially when it comes to juvenile, very differently, and make sure that we decriminalize uh, the system and that we give kids a second chance. Um, so it, it it's it's really interesting because at one point in my life I thought, oh well, this is a unique experience for me. And then understanding that it wasn't necessarily a unique and to ensure that that doesn't happen right. to other kids. It's very important to me. Yeah. I, so, yeah, go it, ahead. I'll just ask you one question. One other question, um, again, because you touched on it and just wondering, because this is, you know, this is an issue that's, um, as you say, does not, didn't start uh, this year with, with the killing of George Floyd, but in fact has, um, you know, has been a, a system uh, in place for for pretty much the history of this country. But as it relates to um, to our youth in particular, what 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 do you think uh, we can we can do? Like, what steps can we take? As you know, uh, can we take a restorative justice approach uh, to adults? Um, and how, what are your views on how we might, um, now seeking your advice, how we might decriminalize? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, frankly, I, I have to say that, that, that a good step was taken, and we, I know we're, we may talk about this a little later, but we really need to remove the bash and the guns from schools, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, you know, the schools are a place of learning, and, and uh, uh, I, I transgression, that a young person engages in should be treated through the eyes of the criminal justice system and handcuffs and prosecution. Unfortunately, in this county, we do extremely well, um, and well, not in a good way, well in the way that we just criminalize young kids very efficiently. So I think that we, we need to decouple from the educational system, number one. Number two, I think that we need to start to acknowledge and apply neuroscience and, and, and understand that young people are going to behave in ways that, because of just their own brain development and, and in the way that we do our work and make sure that rather than creating on ramps to criminalization, that we're creating on ramps to social and educational opportunities. And that's why I'm so uh, gone ho about, and no pun intended, about just really getting rid of, uh, you know, the, so much of the vestiges of the criminal justice system around young people. And, you know, we started a fully restorative justice model in San Francisco for the under 18. And by the way, the under 18 was only because of monetary conditions and the system. And then we did a quasi restorative justice for the 18 to 25. But the whole package really was built around uh, under acknowledging neuroscience and the development of neuroscience today and that we need to treat 
um, you know, our youth in a very different way because their brains are, are, are still in a developmental stage and they're going to do things that we all did and a lot of it's going to reflect the environment, right? So if you are, if you're a young surfer at age 18, you're probably going to take a lot of chances with your life because you think you're invincible. But if you're a kid in the inner city, the chances may translate into other behavior. The, 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 the sort of the, the, the biological condition why you're pushing the envelope is the same. It's just simply the tools may be different because the setting and to ensure that we're not, you know, that we don't take that and turn that around into a criminalization process. So I'm very, very excited um, because there are so many people in the county that are already doing so much good, right? There's some cool great nonprofit. There's obviously people in the school system that are very committed to this. And I want to commit, you know, I want to come in and be a partner to that and, and hopefully get to a place that maybe five or 10 years from now when we're having this conversation saying, wow, you know, we've come such a long way and our kids are in such a better place. So I see a lot of space for that. Uh, and I also see that we're going to have to be intentional about decriminalizing behavior. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, I, you know, I know that we, we, we talked about the stuff, but, you, you know, I mean, I find it also fascinating because you yourself in another line of, uh, you know, spoke in the hub, if you will, right, that they're all so connected and, you know, we're going through this horrible times. How are the people in your district, uh, you know, how are they being impacted? What are current events? What is all this looks like for you? I mean, you, you're in the board of supervisors in the piece and you're, Running for school board. I mean, God, you're in the eye of the storm. Uh, I think we all are, right? Um, I I know it sounds cliche by now, but I do I do think we're all in we're all in this together. Um, you know, I don't know that. I think the experience for the families in my district is very similar to what we're reading about in the papers um, about the impact of the, of this crisis. Uh, families across across the county, the state, and, and the country. I mean, it's been, it's had a devastating in, impact. Um, I, you know, I, I'm seeking to represent a district that uh, is comprised very much of essential workers that are on the front lines of this pandemic and exposing themselves and their families on a daily basis to, um, to COVID-19. Um, at the same time that you know, uh, a significant percentage of, of our families and, you know, people in, in families are, are going to work showing up on the front lines. Um, they're, you know, also experiencing a high level of joblessness and unemployment, um, right? And, and anxiety right now, uh, the possible end of, you know, the employment, um, the additional uh, unemployment uh, uh, support. And sure. so I think, you know, un unfortunately, our families, and I'm facing this both as I think about the families in our district, but my role as um, workforce development deputy for Supervisor Kuhl and some of the challenges that the county is facing that, you know, we're hearing daily. Workers in particular are being faced with, with the, um, you know, with the dilemma of reporting to work and Putting yourself at risk of yep. uh, of infection, um, or you know, looking out for your safety and that of your family, and you know, risking uh, income necessary to keep a roof over your family's head, put food on the table, and so um, you know, the 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 impact is devastating. Um, at the same time, and, and you know, again, this is all the stuff reading in the papers. There's high levels of food insecurity. Um, and, you know, if, if anything, um, uh, along with all these, these devastating impacts, we also are seeing people come together, right? Um, individuals, families, um, institutions. Uh, I know the LA County Federation of Labor, for example, and its affiliates, um, you know, those, um, you know, are coming together on a regular basis to provide, uh, to have uh, organized food distributions um, for families uh, everywhere across the county. And, and so that is, you know, a, we're seeing people come together. LAUSD has gone, ab gone above and beyond, yes. right, to, um, with their grab and grow go centers to provide um, 
uh, to provide food and in some cases other other necessities that families um, gain. So you know they they've continued to do that with students, but their families and I think it's it's been a you know a, a significant effort that's been undertaken, um, and still the need continues to grow. And so, you know, it is a it is a difficult time. And and I, I think the the more we come together, the more that we continue to press on the for for change and the you know the need that we return. I think it's important that we continue to say that we're going to return not to right. the normal that we knew, um, not to the normal now, but really. Uh, pushing ourselves to come out of this with some positive outcomes um, and changes in in how how we see the world and um, how we need to provide as a society to our families, um, both in terms of you know um, a baseline uh, standard of living um, maybe that needs to be lifted for workers for families, but also. Um, you know, I think if nothing more in the education context, this is bringing into sharp relief and closer view um, that schools and, um, you know, say LAUSD in particular, something that I was saying in the primary quite a bit, that our, our schools were being faced with offering students more than um, just an academic education. We, you know, we had students, you know, that are that are coming to our schools with huge needs that go beyond what is offered in a book. Um, and for, you know, for for quite some time now, LAUSD was working uh, teachers and counselors and you know administrators doing those needs on very very few and limited resources. And so. I think now we see that our, you know, what those needs actually were. I think everyone is now seeing everything that schools were providing for our students, um, and I'm hopeful that that you know, a realization that our schools need more resources because if, you know, not if our our students, our schools had uh, needed resources to do more and provide more supports before before COVID. Um, the the needs have just grown exponentially yeah. on on every level and so when we do return to schools we need to make sure we're prepared to invest in those supports for for our students for our teachers uh and for all our employees so um impacts have been devastating and but i hope this is a need for us to really look at uh how we build um a better future for our schools for our students and you know for the rest of LA. You know, and you raise a, a lot of really important points and as someone that actually believes in the concept of community schools because i believe mm -hmm. that uh making the schools a center to our community has so many benefits and as you indicate that we have seen how schools have become a place to deal with food insecurity and other social services and i think you know quite frankly especially in 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 under funded communities, the schools take the role of a kind of the social glue. Uh, and I think it's important because it also then allows the kids to stay in school. Kind of shifting, but, you know, the conversation, but, but along the same vein, you know, the board, the, the school just took $25 million away from the, the, uh, their school police. What are your thoughts about, you know, how that money should be reinvested? You know, what, what should that start? To look well, like? I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm in, in line with what both advocates and, you know, the board voted to direct the, that funding towards. I think it's very important. I think it's you know, certainly a first step in investing in those supports is specifically some of the items that, that were outlined um, by, you know, advocates on the board, but also advocates, um, you know, uh, on that, that were pressing the board to, to take this decision is, you know, more mental health supports more counselors. I think the, the caseload for counselors is outrageous. Right? I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. it's incredibly outrageous right now. Um, more uh, psychiatric uh, yeah, social workers mm -hmm. on campus. Um, I think, and I think perhaps begins to scratch the surface of, of what that need is. Um, you know, is in, in, in my campaign um, during the primary, I, you know, I did stress that we we need to invest more, more in these supports. Looking at our current budget as, as LAUSD, um, 
to identify where the, that funding might come from, but also, you know, thinking about, to your point about, you know, community schools, I think community schools are an important and an important model for us to pursue and something that um, when I co-founded uh, Reclaim Our Schools LA was the centerpiece of the work that we did, which is, you know, to build and invest in community schools as the heart of, of the community, but also, you know, through partnerships. So we're not relying solely on LAUSD right. uh, limited budget to provide those supports to students, but are there partnerships that we can engage in with, with other entities, you know, with other entity, possibly uh, county agencies, city agencies to um, provide those resources or provide guidance um, on how we do better by our students on those issues of mental health, of counseling. Um, and, you know, and of course we need to continue to be, you know, fighters and advocates at the state and federal sure that our students and our schools are getting the resources they need to deliver on these uh, services. Oh, wonderful. I, I hope to actually, if I were to be elected, to be able to give the board the opportunity to take some money away from our jail, jail system. Be fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm gonna try really hard. <laughs> Um, that'd be great. Uh, so, oh my goodness, um, this has been a, a, I absolutely appreciate this, um, this discussion, um, and, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, okay. I've lost my train of thought. Um, well, you know what, I mean, I, I, I can jump here and give you a little yeah. bit of time to, Yes, because it really, you know, our, our conversation really, for me, it generates so many thoughts in, in uh, because I, I am such a believer in, the, in, in what you believe in and your work. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that, um, and I'm very who you are too, and one of the things that for always for me is always a question, how do we, how do we get the community into the criminal justice system so that they have a greater voice. And, and, and I think that certainly the schools play a role in that, uh, obviously other organizations, and of course, you know, our elected, uh, elected officials do. But, you know, one of the things that I'm really hoping to do, if I were to be elected, is to really increase the voice of uh, the community into the system and, and and just as importantly increase the voice of young people i think that young people are often ignored um and i think there is there's there's so much wisdom sometimes when we sit down and listen to young people uh, and i know that because i you know one of the things that i did as a district attorney is that we we had we spent a lot of time working in the schools and we we listened to young kids and we worked things like hate crimes and other things and uh but just in general terms i think that the the removing the barriers for our communities to become part of the decision making process into criminal justice whether it's prosecutions or whether it's you know funding uh i think they're so critical and, and one of the things that i would hope to do is to to partner with the school district, obviously, um, in order to, to provide opportunities to come in and, and, and you know, just kind of tell us how they view the world and what would they like the world to look like. You know, it's really interesting that there are a lot of stuff that basically have looked at the, you know, sort of brain development mm -hmm. for human beings and, and you know, you know, if you look at uh, very young people at age two, three, four, five, uh, we're all pretty much, unless there is some, you know, there's some some physical or bi biological, uh, you know, problem, our IQ levels are very similar, right? It's not a huge diversion, meaning that everybody's yeah. pretty smart at about age three, five, and then you know, we we as we grow what not to think, what not to do, what, you know, and, and by the time that we get to be in our late teens, you know, we have been inculturated in a way that, you know, for some, if they're in the right place, they, they continue to grow and so many others are not, uh, uh, or certainly not as much as they could. And, and I have this incredible urgency to bring 
community voices in general, but really bring young people's voices and give them a place in the criminal justice system. And, and I would love to be a partner with you and hopefully others in that, in that journey. That would be fantastic. And, uh, and, and as you, you see, um, definitely the, the, the students at LUSD right now are def up, up for um, are partnering with you uh, and others, including the school board on, on developing that path and that vision, um, the new vision to handle education, how we, you know, how we approach safety and others. So there's, there is a willing, um, there are partners good, out there. Good, good. We need, we need the youth and the, <laughs> you know, the, the, right. the start, they are, they are definitely our future. And we have to do everything that we can to make sure that we, that they get an opportunity to do better than we have. That's right. right? Uh, That's we right. haven't done as well. Okay. That's Whether right. It's environmentally, criminal justice, uh, race, uh, you know, our, unfortunately our generation behind. So we need to make sure that we put ourselves on, on, uh, on a fast track and, and let the, the next generation of the time and take us to a different place. Let me ask you something, Patricia. You know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm assuming that you're going to get elected, so I'm, you know, being very positive here. That hopefully we both are going to get elected. Uh, you know, what, what would be your piece, and how would you implement? Well, you know, the, it's um, as much as we have to look at the top priority right now is to, um, you know, open open our schools safely. Uh, right, I think that is a front of mind for everyone. And while, um, you know, if elected, I won't uh, on the board until early next year. Um, I, I still think we're gonna be in the midst of, you know, the, the pandemic. Um, it's, it's unclear where exactly we'll be. My hope is that, you know, we'll have um, gotten to a point where we can, you know, have our schools open again. And so I think at that point, it really is the top priority is maintaining a level of safety for our, our students, for teachers, for our classified employees in the school environment. I think, you know, priorities have maybe shifted yeah. just a little bit since, since I first launched my campaign. I think for all of us, we never imagined we would be doing in, in this crisis. And so um, that certainly is is uh, top of mind. You know, aside from that, I think the the things for me remain pretty much the same, just a different environment. And I think um, addressing a need, as I mentioned earlier, that has grown exponentially. Right. So my 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 priorities for uh, for our schools have always been uh, one is to you know continue to champion and. Um, and invest in our in our public education in our public schools, and that really does mean fighting for every dollar uh, that we possibly can at the local level, state level, and federal level, and, and being very mindful about our budgeting on the you know as a school board and transparency as well, um, because we have partners with us that that also <coughs> have deserve to know um, deserve to know how how our resources yeah. and how the public's resources are being spent to advance a quality education for our students. So, you know, resources and investment is a top priority. And then with that, as you know, as it relates to the $25 million that have recently been uh, diverted um, into student supports is this question of, you know, uh, providing more frontline supports for our students. A lot has changed in what the need is. Maybe the scale has, has grown. Uh, some, but we need to make sure that there are, you know, counseling services for our students. We need nurses that has, you know, continued to be, you know, it's something that um, you take bargain for, but, you know, something that parents, and as a parent, I can tell you, I definitely feel safer knowing that there is uh, a nurse on campus on a regular basis. Um, so, you know, we need more of those frontline supports for our students of all, of all ages. Um, smaller class sizes. This is, you know, um, this continued to be a, um, yeah. an issue for everyone pre-COVID, and now it's uh, it seems like a not seems it will be a yeah. non-negotiable yeah. requirement. We cannot go back into the classroom with yeah. 30, 40 kids. That um, you know, in a in an era yeah. of pandemic, that yeah. is a non-starter. Uh, and so, and you know, but aside from the the health issues. 
you know, it's just been proven and shown over and over again that children learn better uh, when they have more individual attention. I think that's the same for a 12th grader as it is for a kindergartner. And as a mother of a second grader, I will tell you that even a 25 kids is too big. Um, and, you know, that's about roughly the size of my daughter's classroom. And, you know, um, you don't, with one teacher, I mean, I, I can only be with my daughter one-on-one. -on -one. I cannot imagine a room full of, of seven-year-olds, right? And so um, we do need to, to manage that. And, you know, I, these are a, a lot of the, well, my, my top priorities um, that I would, I would, you know, continue to push for and find resources for um, as a board member. And then, you know, not finally, but another one that's just important, I think like cuts through so much of this is meaningful parent and community engagement. Um, I think it is so important for uh, any school district and any school to see parents and families as a meaningful partner, um, right? That they can engage and that they can problem solve with together. I think we, we need to really solidify those partnerships. Uh, we need to engage parents because parents um, as much as schools themselves, um, you know, are, are have, you know, together we form a team on how we support our students and parents, I think, want desperately to be able to um, support their kids through their education, but don't know how, um, don't always know the avenues uh, to engage the school in how to best support their students or get the, the supports that their students need. And this is especially true you know, in, in a district like LA's, um, you know, in a county like LA, where we have so many uh, immigrant communities that have language barriers uh, and find themselves, you know, um, the bureaucracy that is LAUSD. And I think we need to find ways to um, help them navigate it and make a bureaucracy for them, um, as well as, you know, I've, I've had many conversations with with special needs. And so we need to also find better ways that um, help them become better advocates or actually just listen to as they're advocating for their for their children. So um, yeah, I think those those partnerships are really, really key to the success of our students and our schools. Absolutely. They're community schools, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, they should be. I think we need to you know, emphasize that yeah. element of it more for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, so interesting how it's so important for every institution, but especially every public institution to, to bring the community in and to ensure that the community is, is so critical, whether it's criminal justice or education or quite frankly, anything else that we do. Yeah. So I do. I mean, before we leave the conversation, I know we're we're uh, we've been chatting for a little while, but you know, I I not maybe in in hearing you speak a lot. Um, really curious about what lessons you you drew, and you know, of a police officer, um, and kind of how you see how you see that has shaped your, your view of, you know, what some of the changes are that need to happen now. Um, and, you know, how, how officials in that uh, context can really partner and support communities um, from a, you know, day-to-day -day yeah. perspective. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, there are many things that Mike certainly have sort of form who I am today. Um, you know, obviously one is the more rudimentary, just the understanding how police works today um, and understanding both the, the, the things that are done well, as well as the failures, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that um, one of the, 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 you know, unquestionable convictions that I have uh, coming from my work in policing is that the, the majority of the men and women that work in police departments, just like in teachers or any other profession, they want to do the right, you know, and, and unfortunately often the cultures and the leadership um, 
lead to bad outcomes. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe that anybody comes into policing with the intent of doing evil things. But I, you know, we know that that occurs from time to time, although it's not often, but you know, when they do occur, they, they have such an import in our community. So, you know, in my own evolution through policing and then as a prosecutor, I, I've come to, to uh, the conclusion that there are certain things that have to occur, um, you know, that have to sometimes come from outside policing. Uh, and then hopefully then have leadership within policing that will join in. But I think that, that having a true community partnership, and not just lip service, right? But having communities that really uh, have a say in how much we're gonna fund a police department, how much we're gonna fund the system and, and the funding, where should it go? Uh, as opposed to having this very insular decisions that are made in, in sort of this uh, markets, you know, without any real input because we know better than anybody else. Uh, I think that that is something that fortunately uh, occurs way too often in policing. And I think that that is one of the downfalls and we're paying the price of that. So I think, you know, my own personal experience uh, in evolving through that process to understand where police can excel and where police doesn't and where police fails uh, and trying to bring a different reality so that future police, you know, police officers in the future get a better opportunity to do what idealistically brought them to the work in the right. first place, right? Because I, because, you know, I sat on many entry level interviews for police officers and I can tell you, I could almost put a tape recorder and play it over and over again. One of the reasons, you know, one of the things that almost always I heard is that people came in because they wanted to, right? They really care about their community. And that really, you know, that always resonated with me because it had nothing to do with individual race or gender. It was so, so typical. And then, you, you know, you look at the evolution within the culture and, what, you know, you see the, the, some of the things that happen later. Um, and you say, how do we go from this beginning you had this human being that came in with all this uh, incredible desire to do good. And then all of a sudden this ends up in the other. And, you know, I, I'm not, uh, you know, naive enough not to know that some people may have said that because they expected that that's what we wanted to hear. But I know that the majority of the people that come in really came in with that. And how do we, how do we take that desire to do good and to make a difference and make it grow and never let that light go off? and turn into something else. And I think that that requires intentionality from the entire system. That has to be more than just simply training or policies. I think that we have to create clear bumpers around behavior and then hold police leadership as well as prosecutors. And you know, everybody in the criminal system hold ourselves accountable when the results are something other than. And so I would say that uh, my patently um, has taught me that the majority of the people that come in this work come in with very, very pure heart. Taught me that often culture and leadership or lack of leadership leads people into a path that then becomes completely the, the reverse of the motivation that originally brought that human being into policing. And I think that, you know, our generation has an obligation to write that. Obviously, we cannot ignore the history of policing in this country because that part of the problem is, you know, a lot of people have been shocked by what they saw with George Floyd. And I think in a way is 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 galvanized the white community in ways that, you know, quite frankly, the African American community was all that they were being discriminated against, right? The Latino community. But we have to, you know, in, in this process, we have to recognize that policing in this country and the criminal justice system really became an enabler of slavery. Uh, you know, when people run, when slaves run away, police went and picked them up and they brought them back. The lynching to make sure that the message was clear, you don't run away. And then when slavery became uh, a law after civil war, evolution of the system, I want to make sure the people that were former slaves will still continue to live in the slave-like conditions. And that continued all through the 20th century. And it got us into, you know, the, the 80s and 90s and, and to, to some extent where we are today and the mass incarceration period. 
And, and that's why I often tell people that I've gone from being part of a system to thinking the system can be reformed to get into a place that I said, actually, the system doesn't need reform because the system is doing exactly what it was assigned to do, right? So the question then for me becomes, how do we reimagine a different system that breaks away from the shackles of that past? And, I, and we're gonna need good people in uniform to be able to help us get there. So I'm, I'm very excited for the historical moment. Um, and I think that we're probably in a place, and certainly in my lifetime I've never seen, where I've seen not just poor black people and poor brown people saying we need reform, I'm seeing affluent white people saying we need reform. And that I think is different than anything that I saw before. And it really leads me to, to a, a place of uh, hope, um, but always, put that place of hope against the history that we have a tendency to yes. go back and do the same thing over again. And, and that's why I think it's so important that we don't allow ourselves to go back. So that's kind of where I am, sort of my, my if you will, uh, my own development within policing and, and how I think it's taken me to where I am today. That's great. And yes, and that's, we do, we need uh, the right leaders in place um, to hold on to the the change forward um, as you as you just said um, yeah we cannot after all of this after you know after after the many um, moments of movements we we can't allow uh, ourselves to go back again and so I uh, you know appreciate your your vision for how we revision uh, you know our our justice system um, I yeah, have faith that we can move forward for sure. We have to. We yes. we don't have an option. You know, we we are this this is our generation's moment, right? And, and if we squander this, then shame on all of us. You know, uh, but I think we're almost at a wrap here, yes. right? I think we need to thank our viewers. We do uh, for all the time they're spending here with us, and I think you know, remind everybody we have an election coming up, and. Mm -hmm. and and we got two people here in front of the screen that want to get elected to do the right things for you guys. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you want to put yourself a plug for your campaign? I'll do sure. that. Um, before I do that, I, uh, you know, I'd like to thank our viewers uh, today. Thank you for spending in, uh, to know us as we get to know each other. Um, and also thank the LA County Democratic Party for, for setting this up. Um, you know, uh, this, this little, the, the chat, um, which is, you know, um, virtual in nature, but I, I do appreciate the time to get to know you. Um, and yes, yeah, so folks, uh, again, as a reminder, my name is Patricia Castellanos. I am running for LAUSD School Board. You can go to my website to find out more about uh, my campaign and find out more about me at patriciacastellanos.com. Wonderful, Patricia. It's a pleasure uh, connecting, getting to know you a little better. Again, I want to thank our viewers. Um, you know, I want to remind everybody we have an election in November, and it's a huge uh, election. It has a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, the consequences are are existential for our for our community, and our country. Thank the uh, you know the LA County Democratic Party not only for obviously your your endorsements support but more importantly for the work that you do day in and day out for working class people and for everyone in our community um you know for those that may not may come in a little late i'm george gascon and i'm running for discerning um, and i encourage you to look at our website it's georgegascon.org and i know sometimes people say dot com please no dot com dot <laughs> org uh so it's g-o-r-g-e gascon g-a-s-c-o-n uh dot org and again thank you everyone Everyone, Patricia, Beth Thoughts and Abrazos and Buena Suerte, Si Podemos. Thank you so much, everyone.